All right. Good. Uh, let's see. I guess good afternoon or good lunchtime. I hope everybody's got them a little bite to eat, something cold to drink, and is ready to settle in for a really fascinating talk. Um, thank you today for joining us to learn about the original conflict over the Equal Rights Amendment. We're excited to have the opportunity to have Professor Rebecca DeWolf speak to us and answer questions about the relevance of the original conflict around the ERA, long before some of us and our mothers and grandmothers were involved. And as a special surprise, one lucky person will get an autographed copy of Gendered Citizenship. The winner's gonna be announced at the end of the program, well, where we will ask for your address and we'll ask you to put that into the chat, sending it to the host and panelists. Now, this is a webinar, so everyone is muted. And we're gonna ask you to put questions in the Q&A section versus the chat, if you can, please. Uh, we'll be monitoring those Q&A. And when um, uh, Rebecca is through with her talk, then we will definitely answer those questions. Uh, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. So now, please allow me to introduce Professor DeWolf. Rebecca DeWolf is a historian with a PhD in history from American University. She has extensive experience as an educator, researcher, and writer. Her areas of expertise include European history and United States history, and her thematic specialties include gender and women's history, politics, and United States constitutional culture. Her research has achieved recognition through several awards and grants, including the Dirksen Center Congressional Research Fellowship at American University. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, research Grant and American University's Vice Provost Doctoral Research Award and a Clendenin Dissertation Fellowship at American University. Her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, History News Network, New America Weekly, and Frontiers. Her book, Gendered Citizenship, was published by the University of Nebraska Press in the fall of 21. She's been a really busy lady since then. Uh, it is available on Amazon and other bookstores. And her book explores the contours of women's civic standing in the post-suffrage era through an examination of the competing civic ideologies embedded in the conflict over the Equal Rights Amendment from 1920 to 1963. And now I am pleased to turn this meeting over to Professor Rebecca DeWolf. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I'm going to try to share my screen real quick. Nope, oh, not that one, this one. Okay. All right. So I just want to give everyone a heads up. I am recovering from a virus that I caught for my kids. So just bear with me. I might be a little slower today than usual. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, as Lori said, my name is Rebecca DeWolf and I am a historian with a PhD in history from American University. Here we go. My newly released book uh, from the University of Nebraska Press, Gendered Citizenship, builds on my PhD dissertation research. That research looks at the changing nature of US citizenship after the passage of the 19th Amendment. For those that are not as familiar with the history, I'll just note that the 19th Amendment removed sex as a valid reason for withholding the right to vote. So it's often known as the amendment that affirmed women's right to vote. So one of my main areas of historical research has been to look at how the removal of sex as a valid reason for withholding the right to vote impacted the U.S.'s legal tradition because so much of the U.S. legal system was built around the idea that only men were fit for rights-bearing citizenship. So this afternoon, I want to discuss with you all a few of the key aspects of my book. My book explores the competing civic ideologies embedded in the original conflict over the Equal Rights Amendment, ERA. Um, many of you might be thinking, okay, what the heck does she mean by competing civic ideologies and what does that have to do with the 19th Amendment? And wasn't the ERA basically dead until the 1970s? And this afternoon, I'm gonna try to sort some of that out with you all. So it's probably best to first lay out um, some of the ERA's basic historical background. Even though much attention has been paid to the ERA struggle as it unfolded in the 1970s, the amendment was actually first devised in the early 1920s. In 1923, after an arduous, almost three-year drafting process, Alice Paul of the National Women's Party, NWP, and the principal author of the ERA settled on a version of the amendment which read, 
men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subject, subject to its jurisdiction. In December of that year, Senator Charles Curtis and Representative Daniel Reed Anthony Jr. introduced the ERA into Congress. In 1943, Alice Paul reworded the amendment so that it aligned more closely with the language of the 19th Amendment. To this day, the primary first clause of the amendment reads, equality of rights under the law should not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. So most of the existing literature on the ERA examines the state ratification struggles of the 1970s and early 1980s. So these works have been mostly concerned with figuring out why the ERA failed to gain enough state ratifications when things looked so great for the amendment in the early 1970s. So some of these works have looked at uh, the political difficulties ERA supporters encountered, and some of them look at Phyllis Shafley's revitalization of grassroots conservatism and its devastating impact on the ERA state ratification battles. Yet these works tend to make it seem like the ERA struggle was silent or dormant before the 1970s. As I discuss in my book, if we want to know why the ERA failed to get enough state approvals during the 1970s state ratification battles, we have to return to the earlier conflict because the original ERA conflict created the US's gendered citizenship. Now, there are a few other works that have explored the earliest years of the ERA conflict. These works have looked at the struggle mostly in the 1920s and a little bit in the 1930s. For the most part, these works understand the earliest years of the ERA struggle as a dispute among women, about women, and only concerning women. These works have mostly framed the early conflict as a fight between feminists over the priorities of the women's movement after the passage of the 19th Amendment. According to their analyses, one group typically labeled social feminists opposed the ERA and worked to expand women's involvement in social reform programs, while the other group of feminists, sometimes they're identified as radical feminists or egalitarian feminists, supported the ERA in an effort to secure absolute uh, sexual equality. So the second body of work has primarily employed a female-centric narrative that emphasizes how the early ERA campaign affected the women's movement. Now, the previous writing on the ERA has offered incredibly important insights, but my study maintains that the original ERA conflict is best understood not mainly as a struggle between feminist ideologies, but rather as a conflict between competing civic ideologies. So one of the things I attempted to show in my book is that the ERA conflict before the 1970s was not just a bunch of feminists arguing with one another about the trajectory of the women's movement after the passage of the 19th Amendment. To be clear, a crucial crucial aspect of the original conflict did involve disputes among female activists over the priorities of the women's movement, but the focus on these disputes has concealed the larger story and significance of the original ERA conflict. As I show in my book, when you take a wider view of the ERA struggle, so when you look at it before the 1970s and examine how the conflict involved more groups than just women activists who had been associated with the suffrage struggle, you start to see that the conflict involved more than just women fighting with one another over the priorities of women's activism. As I argue in my book, the original conflict not only involved former suffragists, but actually included an array of men and women, uh, politicians, intellectuals, labor activists, social reformers, and government officials. Although strands of feminism undoubtedly influenced the aspects of the original battle, the larger conflict encompassed a struggle over the fundamental principles of US citizenship. So the participants in the original ERA conflict argued about the concept of rights, and there were intense concerns about how to determine women's rights as citizens now that women presumably had a constitutional recognition of their right to vote. The story of the ERA begins with the passage of the 19th Amendment because that amendment profoundly altered women's relationship to the state. So to start, the 19th Amendment disrupted the traditional understanding of US citizenship that had given men authority over women in law and in custom. Before the 19th Amendment, US political leaders upheld a single standard for full citizenship status, which venerated masculine strength and followed the common law tradition of domestic relations or the doctrine known as coverture. According to Coverture, women did not possess a direct relationship to the state. It also assumed that married women held no civic identity separate from their husband's status. In essence, Coverture submerged a woman's civic identity into her husband's status. Um, a dominant belief in early US society was that the majority of women married. So Coverture also stood for the legal process by which women moved from dependent daughter to dependent wife. The idea that women were naturally dependent creatures who relied on men for survival permeated early US society so deeply that it was commonly held in law and in custom that women were under the authority and control of the male head of the household, whether it be their father, brother, or husband. 
While women, specifically white women before the Civil War and then after the Civil War, also black women, were understood to be citizens and that they were inhabitants of the nation, they were excluded from the concept of rights-bearing citizenship because women were seen to be incapable of maintaining an independent, autonomous relationship to the state. Coverture also signified a system of sex-specific marital duties in which wives were thought to owe their husbands services, such as childbearing and homemaking. In return, the legal tradition presumed that husbands provide their wives with uh, shelter and financial support. In treating women as covered by their husbands, coverture imposed several restrictions on married women, such as their inability to hold property, draft wills, control their earnings, to sue and be sued, to vote, hold public office, serve on juries, and enter into contracts. While state level reforms in the mid 19th century did allow uh, women to start having more agency and their ability to uh, hold property, there were significant limitations to these reforms, which allowed men to continue to exert authority over women, especially in regard to women's domestic labor and women's rights in the public sphere. As a result, elements of coverture continue to play a determining role in the confinement of women's civic identity well into the early 20th century, which I discuss in length in the first chapter of my book. When US lawmakers finally passed the 19th Amendment, it displaced this earlier societal framework that had given men authority over women. But it also failed to provide a unified set of principles for determining women's rights as citizens after sex had been removed as a valid reason for withholding the right to vote. Because of the destabilizing nature of the 19th Amendment, a period of constitutional uncertainty developed in which political leaders and legal authorities clashed over the constitutional implications of federal women's suffrage. At issue in these debates was whether voter status commanded other civic rights. In these debates, political leaders and legal authorities wrestled over the following questions. Did the passage of the 19th Amendment mean that women should be treated as citizens on similar terms of men? If sex was no longer a valid reason for withholding the right to vote, could it still be a valid reason for withholding other rights? And what were the rights of citizenship after all? Is sex still a legitimate reason for limiting or restricting women's ability to work in certain occupations, serve on juries, hold public office, and have an independent nationality status? And what about the array of state laws that still favored husbands and fathers over wives and daughters with relation to property, earnings, contracting, inheritance, and guardianship rights? So these debates played out in several court cases and in the political discourse of the post 19th Amendment era. The concerns and debates over the transformative possibilities of the 19th Amendment morphed into the original ERA conflict which produced two different ideas about US citizenship, which I call emancipationism on one hand and protectionism on the other hand. Emancipationists supported the ERA as a way to guarantee that men and women could participate as citizens on the same terms. Protectionists on the other hand, opposed the ERA. In their minds, the supposedly inherent different societal functions of men and women citizens required the law to be free to treat citizens differently on account of sex. Overall, emancipationists contended that US political ideals affirm the right of men and women citizens to be held to the same legal standard, while protectionists maintained that true sexual equity demanded two separate standards of rights for men and women citizens. From the early 1920s to the early 1960s, which is the period that I identify as the original ERA conflict, these two warring views struggled over the very idea of rights. Protectionists eventually prevailed at the end of the original ERA conflict. In the end, protectionists redefined the concept of full rights-bearing citizenship from a single gender masculine model to a dual gender model. Despite the generally well-meaning approach of many protectionists, their victory in the original ERA conflict led to the advancement of a gendered concept of citizenship that justifies a lack of equal treatment for women and the perpetuation of sex discrimination. The original ERA conflict then not only served as the vehicle through which Americans forged new concepts of citizenship, but it also produced a lasting belief in the supposed justice as sex specific rights, which still shapes US society to this day. All right. Now, many of you might be wanting to know a little bit more about how I use the term emancipationism in my book. So I'll just touch on that for a minute. In my work, emancipationism refers to a particular form of thought that developed after the passage of the 19th Amendment. It advocates for the absolute equality of men and women citizens before the law. And as noted, it encapsulates the core ideas behind the pro-ERA position. 
I use the words emancipationist and emancipationism to capture the pro-ERA position because ERA supporters often drew upon the notion of fully emancipating women from a legal system that had historically given men authority over women. In fact, ERA supporters often use the exact words emancipate or to emancipate when describing the ERA's purpose. The ERA, according to Representative Lewis Ludlow, a major supporter of the amendment, was the quote, necessary corollary and supplement of equal suffrage. It's the crowning act that will bring women to a status of the complete emancipation, which they are entitled by all the rules of right and justice. During the original ERA conflict, ERA supporters insisted that although the 19th Amendment affirmed women's standing as citizens in their own right, sex-based laws and customs continue to assign to women an inferior civic status. In amendment supporters' arguments for the ERA, they often point to how the remnants of the common law tradition of domestic relations or the doctrine known as coverture had sustained the constraints of women's civic autonomy. These restraints include limitations on women's right to hold public office, serve on juries, have ownership over their earnings, control property equally with their spouses, maintain an independent docile status, have an independent nationality status, and work in certain occupations. For ERA supporters, such restrictions on newly legalized voters created not only fluctuating definitions of women's legal personhood, but also constitutional inconsistencies with regards to the rights of US citizens. In the mindsets of ERA proponents, complete constitutional sexual equality was the only way to fully emancipate a class of voters from their legal subjugation. I'm just going to take a sip of water. So I'm also going to unpack how I use the words protectionist and protectionism in my book. So as I use them in my book, protectionism and protectionist represents a specific way of reasoning that primarily arose after the advent of federal women's suffrage. It does not refer exclusively to advocates of special labor legislation for women. Special labor legislation or sex-specific labor laws arose in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to regulate women's working conditions and shield them from economic exploitation. The basis for these laws drew from the idea that all women were mothers or potential mothers and that their roles in the domestic realm necessitate extra special legal safeguards. As I explained throughout my book, their protectionist habit of mind not only included liberal-minded persons who opposed the ERA and backed special labor laws for women, but it also included conservative individuals who didn't like labor laws. So to put it simply, protectionism espouses the virtues of sex-specific rights. It encompasses the core ideas behind the anti-ERA stance since both conservative and liberal ERA opponents criticized the ERA as a threat to the sex-based legal distinctions that upheld what they understood to be women's natural rights special protection. As one anti-ERA pamphlet from the original conflict alleged, quote, men and women are different in biological structure and social function. State laws regulating working conditions for women, family support, guardianship of children, property and inheritance, marriage and divorce recognize these differences. To protectionists, sex-specific legal treatment recognize what they believe to be women's separate societal roles and responsibilities. A shared desire to preserve the law's ability to treat men and women differently on account of sex after the passage of the 19th Amendment fueled the protectionist position. Alongside this desire, protectionists believe that while the law should respect women as rights-bearing citizens, it should not categorically group women's rights with men's rights. As I describe in my book, protectionists reasoned that actual sexual fairness meant securing two distinct but equally valued sets of rights for men and women citizens. So a key point here is that the arguments against the ERA, especially as we see them during the original conflict, didn't simply revolve around the idea that women shouldn't have rights or that they should be denied their rights as full citizens. In actuality, ERA opponents insisted that they were the ones who were protecting women's rights as citizens. Through the course of the original ERA conflict, protectionists moved the argument against equal rights or equal legal treatment away from a pre-19th amendment emphasis on the reasons to ex exclude women from certain rights of citizenship towards a post-19th amendment emphasis on the need to protect and develop a distinct citizenship for women that supposedly came with its own set of rights. For protectionists, Women's special rights included things like being exempted from the military, uh, sh shielded from the harms of capitalism, and kept safe in their domestic roles. In this sense, as I argue in my book, protectionists modernized or updated the justification for sex-specific treatment by forming a new notion of full US citizenship, which included two separate standards of rights for men and women citizens. <laughs>
Until the early 1970s, the long running struggle between uh, protectionists and emancipationists defied conventional categories of political ideology. So what do I mean by that? Throughout the original ERI conflict, both emancipationists and protectionists include prominent liberal and conservative variations. So those who adhered to the emancipationist position um, included conservatives such as Senator Edward Burke of Nebraska to liberals such as feminist activist Emma Guffrey Miller of the National Women's Party. While conservative minded emancipationists supported the ERA as a way to remove what they believed to be unnecessary government practices that restricted women's ability to compete in the economic realm, liberal emancipationists saw the amendment as an effective tool for expanding social policies so that they could benefit men and women alike. Even with these differences, both conservative and liberal emancipationists expressed their support for the ERA in terms of ensuring that men and women citizens could enjoy the same standard of rights. Likewise, those who followed the protectionist line of reasoning also included liberal and conservative variations. Protectionists, for instance, include influential conservatives such as Senator Robert Taft of Ohio, as well as prominent liberals like the first woman Secretary of Labor, Frances Perkins. Both conservative and liberal ERA opponents believed that women had a natural right to special protection. They just differed over where that protection should come from. For conservative ERA opponents, women's special protection should come from the male head of the household, while liberal ERA opponents believe that government reform efforts could also serve as an effective tool of protection for women. Even so, both conservative and liberal ERA opponents criticized the ERA as a threat to the sex-based legal distinctions that upheld what they understood to be women's natural right to special protection. So in the original conflict, conservatives and liberals were attracted to both the emancipationist and protectionist viewpoints. Just gonna take another sip of water. Okay. Over the course of the early 1970s, the ideological aspects of the ERA struggle did evolve to reflect what we now understand to be conventional political positions. More liberals came to adopt the campaign for gender equality, while more conservatives came to support the insistence on sex-specific legal standards. And that alignment is due to an ideological development that took root in the mid to late 1960s. That development transformed how people thought about the relationship between sex and gender as intellectuals and activists began to examine how many of the stereotypical behavioral traits generally assigned to men and women were socially created concepts and not essential products in nature. This ideological development allowed for a more fluid understanding of gender and sex that theoretically expanded the societal position of women beyond what had been previously understood to be biologically inescapable roles in the domestic sphere. That expansion of women's roles encouraged more liberals to back the ERA as a way to ensure that social benefits applied equally to the male or female parent responsible for childcare. As more liberals embraced emancipationism, the conservative wing of the protectionist position grew to engulf the anti-ERA campaign effort. Thus, by the mid 1970s, the new conceptualization of the relationship between sex and gender had heightened the liberal dimensions of emancipationism and the conservative components of protectionism. But my book is more interested in retracing the scenes, details, and debates of the ERA struggle at an earlier time when the conflict still surpassed the typical liberal and conservative disputes of 20th century America. By utilizing a wealth of primary source materials, such as the often overlooked congressional sources on the ERA, my research shows that liberals and conservatives were not always opposed to one another when it came to the issue of absolute constitutional sexual equality. As the dynamics of the ERA conflict before the 1970s suggest, support for and opposition to the ERA are not positions that are fundamentally tied to either conservatism or liberalism. Ultimately, at its roots, the ERA struggle reflects a battle between two different interpretations of US citizenship and not a typical political fight between liberals and conservatives. Okay. From the 1920s through the early 1960s, protectionists and emancipationists fought over the very idea of rights. At the start of the conflict, the protectionist position was quite dominant. Even though Congress held several hearings on the amendment during the 1920s, the amendment failed to make much progress during the 1920s. Up until the early 1930s, most Americans sided with the protectionist view because of an, an enduring societal attachment to women's traditional domestic duties and the political conservatism of the 1920s. Just of water. Nonetheless, the supremacy of the protectionist position was not gonna last forever. 
Um, as ongoing economic troubles and, intent, and the intense worldwide political upheaval of World War II opened the door to the rise of emancipationism. As I discussed in length in my book, support for the ERA started to grow in the mid to late 1930s because the Depression era increase in the regulation of working women pushed more women's groups to recognize the potential disadvantages of sex-specific labor laws. For many women, such laws often hindered their ability to find and maintain gainful employment. The NWP also cultivated this growing discontent with sex-specific labor policies through its Depression era economic campaign which especially attacked the escalating discriminations against working women. By 1937, many women's groups that had backed the NWP's economic campaign had become official backers of the ERA. World War II inspired even more support for the amendment because it further destabilized the traditional sexual order. Many uh, sex-based labor laws were suspended during the war with minimum harmful effects, which then called into, the, which then called into question the need for such policies. The war also uh, pulled more women into the workforce and it put them to work in unprecedented ways. For instance, more women were working in what had been traditionally male dominated industries like shipbuilding. Because of the economic demands of World War II, women were now being asked to build the materials needed to win the war. In all, more people embraced the pro ERA position during the 1940s because the economic needs of the war expanded women's public responsibilities. This new reality gave greater legitimacy to women workers and it illuminated their value as citizens. But emancipationists could not simply rely on the changing political and socioeconomic circumstances to push the pendulum of public opinion in their favor. Rather, they had to actively connect the ERA to the pressing concerns that were preoccupying the attention of the nation's leaders. So to this end, emancipationists linked the ERA to the avowed war aims of the United States and their wartime campaign for the amendment. As Alice Paul, the ever dedicated creator of the movement for the ERA urged in one wartime article for Congressional Digest, quote, at this moment when the United States is engaged in a war with the avowed purpose of establishing freedom and equality for the whole world, the United States should hasten to set its own house in order by seeking the immediate adoption of the Equal Rights Amendment. According to emancipationists, passage of the ERA would boost the war effort by showing that the US stood true to its democratic principles. As support for the ERA grew, influential figures and organizations came out to publicly support the amendment. By 1944, 24 national organizations had endorsed the ERA. By that point, the amendment had gained the backing of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, the first Black American women's organization to endorse the amendment. As the number of women's organizations supporting the ERA multiplied, backing for the amendment also grew among public figures and celebrities, such as actresses Katherine Hepburn and Helen Hayes, radio broadcaster Dorothy Thompson, as well as authors Pearl Buck, uh, James Trussell Adams, and Channing Pollock. More politicians also came out in support of the amendment. In 1944, 17 Republicans and eight Democratic governors had expressed their support for the amendment, and both the Democratic and Republican parties endorsed the ERA in their party platforms in 1944. As I discuss in detail in my book, the wartime changes in the United States helped ERA proponents create a coalition of supporters that transcended conventional uh, societal divisions. By the end of the war, the ranks of ERA supporters had grown to include conservatives and liberals, Democrats and Republicans, working class and upper class Americans, as well as white and black Americans. Most importantly, by the, by the end of the war, both the House and Senate Judiciary Committees had reported the ERA favorably. As the NWP's publication Equal Rights put it, this progress in Congress was quote unquote, a splendid climax for the ERA struggle because it now appeared that the ERA stood ready for a vote in both houses of Congress. Okay, so despite the amendment's advancement, the strength of the emancipationist position steadily declined in the post-war era. As I detail in the last chapters of my book, protectionists were able to subdue the emancipationist energy by reorganizing their opposition work into a unified group which revived the anti-ERA campaign. This group was the National Committee to Defeat the Unequal Rights Amendment, NCDURA. Uh, which would later evolve into the National Committee on the Status of Women, and that's the group that spearheaded the effort to create a presidential commission on the status of women. Protections were ultimately able to subdue the emancipationist impulse in the post-war era with a series of measures such as the Women's Status Bill, the Hayden Rider, and the Presence Commission on the Status of Women. Through these measures, protectionists successfully advanced the contention that their position offered an appropriate but limited level of equality that recognized both men and women as rights-bearing citizens while preserving the law's ability to treat citizens differently on account of sex. 
Overall, the original ERA conflict supplied the terrain that allowed Americans to reconceptualize the concept of citizenship so that it corresponded to the changes in women's legal status after the passage of the 19th Amendment. During the original ERA conflict, uh, ERA supporters perfected the emancipationist position by showing that a consistently applied single standard of rights for men and women citizens would be an essential step for emancipating women from the sexual inequities embedded in the US's social fabric. In contrast, amendment opponents in the original conflict produced a lasting belief in the need to protect a distinct set of rights for women as citizens. Now, the original ERA conflict brings to light several important points about the almost century long struggle over the ERA and the history of US citizenship. First, the original ERA conflict shows us that conservatism and liberalism are not inherently attached to either the pro or anti ERA positions. In the original conflict, both emancipationism and protectionism contained pronounced conservative and liberal variations. Yes, certain societal developments can enhance or bring out more of the liberal or conservative elements of each position, but neither the pro or anti ERA positions are categorically tied to either conservatism or liberalism. In other words, the ERA is not necessarily a natural wedge issue between Republicans and Democrats or conservatives and liberals. The amendment has had a long history of transcending traditional political disputes and divides, and it has the potential to do that again. Second, the original ERA conflict also shows us that when society goes through big changes or upheavals, it destabilizes the traditional sexual order, which then calls into question many of the conventional ways of doing things. Big social upheavals and changes create a potential for more people to align with the emancipationist position because those changes often highlight the entrenched problems with the status quo. And the emancipationist position inherently wants to improve the status quo by recognizing that men and women can enjoy the same standard of rights. The societal upheavals brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic may have produced a similar opportunity for the dominant cultural consensus to align with the ethos of emancipationism, which could then help ERA supporters get the full recognition and confirmation of the amendments incorporation into the constitution. But as the course of the original ERA conflict demonstrates the desire to return to stability that has often followed such major upheavals typically creates a ripe environment for protections to regain the dominant position in the ERA struggle. Finally, the original ERA conflict shows us that the opponents to the amendment are not necessarily against women having rights, women's empowerment, or even equality per se. Rather, as the original ERA conflict demonstrates, ERA opponents believe that real sexual equity means protecting a distinct set of rights for women. In the original ERA conflict, ERA opponents were able to suppress the allure of emancipationism or the pro-ERA position by putting forward the idea that sex specific rights rather than equal rights would be fair and more beneficial for women. According to protectionists, equal rights would be harmful for women because it would take away the sex specific rights that women needed as mothers and potential mothers. In all the protectionist victory in the original ERA conflict helped to redefine the concept of rights bearing citizenship from a single gender masculine model to a dual gender model with two different but equally valued standards of rights for men and women citizens. But as I discuss in my book's epilogue, the protectionist notion of limited sexual equality has sustained the restrictions on women's autonomy because it excuses the discriminatory outlook that rights should be dependent on one's sex. To this point, a central idea animating the emancipationist position, especially during the original conflict, was this notion that if sex can be a reason to give or affirm rights, then sex can be a reason to deny or take away rights. In the end, complete constitutional sexual equality will only be obtainable once more people are willing to question the supposed equity of the US's gendered citizenship. And that's where I'm gonna leave my presentation for now. If I can figure out how to stop, okay. All right, thank you so much, Rebecca. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm sure, I know we have several questions. I wanted to just do a, a quick follow-up. Um, you know, when you talk about protectionism in the book, particularly back in the 30s and 40s, when it really started revolving, how does that look in today's society? Um, for example, there was a recent article about uh, Maine, wanting to have an ERA in their own constitution. And yet there were people saying, oh, 
we don't need it. You know, why, why are we doing this? Yeah. Okay. If it's okay with you, can I give a kind of a long answer to that? Sure. Am I long? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's just such an important question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so I think it's sometimes hard to understand why certain liberals were against the ER, right? especially because people like Eleanor Roosevelt opposed it, Francis Perkins opposed it. And these are people that we typically see as the good in history, right? And the ERA is a good mm -hmm. thing in history. So how could the one be against the other, right? So I just want to try to explain a little bit about uh, liberal protectionism, if I can. So I'll just reemphasize that a core belief of protectionism is that the U.S. legal tradition correctly acknowledged the separate roles of men and women citizens by differentiation in the law based on sex. And liberal protectionists, in contrast to their conservative counterparts, were consistently more willing to admit that the U.S. legal tradition had created some outdated laws that resulted in legal disadvantages for women. And they were more active in pursuing measures that aimed to enhance women's societal position. But they still insisted that true sexual equity required the law to be free to treat citizens differently on account of sex. Like all protectionists, liberal amendment opponents felt that men and women's societal functions and societal placements differed and that those differences were so great that they had to be recognized in the law with distinctions based on sex. So that's a very big fundamental difference between liberal uh, protectionists and emancipationists. Unlike um, liberal protectionists, emancipationists believe that the supposed inherent differences between men and women did not preclude them from participating as citizens on the same terms and that they could still enjoy the same standard of rights. So just bear with me here as I'm gonna to get to your question in a second. But um, one of the things I do see floated around a bit when people try to understand why certain uh, notable liberals opposed the ERA during the original conflict is this notion of, well, they were just really fighting about labor legislation uh, or they were just, it was a different strategy for how to achieve equal rights. And there's actually some um, inaccuracies and limitations to that analysis that, that are that's really important to recognize. So one thing, it wasn't just about waiting for um, labor legislation to be extended to men workers. When in the 1930s, uh, when you start to see more and more, more and more protections being extended to men workers with the New Deal initiatives, um, especially the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which Frances Perkins, a big ERA opponent, um, she was one of the architects of the Fair Labor Standards Act. So after the Fair Labor Standards Act is passed in 1938, which is a gigantic move forward for um, providing men workers with protection, you have Francis Perkins testifying against the ERA in a 1945 ERA congressional hearing. If I could just read to you the quote real quick. Um, so she testified at the hearing that unlike the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, sex specific labor laws were specifically quote to, to designed to safeguard women by providing women with days of rest and rest periods and by prohibiting dangerous work or work at night or places deemed unwholesome to the morals and health of women. She concluded that sex specific laws were based on the, quote, the unique biological function of women and their responsibilities as homemakers and mothers of future citizens. That's so important for us to realize that of course liberal protectionists wanted protections to be extended to men workers, but they believed that the types of protections that uh, working women need were going to be different, that they're gonna need even more regulation in the uh, workforce because they believed that there was a double demand on working women's energy. They didn't just have to go out and work, they had to go home and take care of the kids in the house. And they believed that those responsibilities were unique to women, that men couldn't possibly do those responsibilities. So yes, they wanted protections extended to men, but they still believed that the types of protections women workers were gonna need were gonna to have to be sex specific in certain areas. Um, and the other thing that I wanna note is it wasn't just the labor legislation that liberal protectionists were worried about. Um, as you noted in the thirties and also in the forties, when more and more working class women are coming out against sex specific labor laws because it's hindering their ability to find and maintain gainful employment, you see in the correspondence between liberal protectionists, them saying, oh, I think we need to start to downplay the labor aspect and start to emphasize the other things that we have issue with, with the ERI. So one of the things that they would point to, and they did this a lot in the 1938 congressional hearing, was they, they would say, if you pass the ERA, it will take away a married woman's right to be supported by her husband. Uh, one of the ideas embedded in coverture was this notion that husbands have the right to their wives' bodies and to their wives' uh, domestic labor. And in return, they provide their wives with financial support and protection. Um, and what protectionists did is they reframed that outlook to being, well, 
married women have a right to be provided for. And the other things that they would claim also was that, and this is liberal protections too, that uh, passage of the ERA would decriminalize rape, that it would force women into the military and that it would take away maternity benefits. And of course, we're gonna see that come back around the seventies, but it's really important to know that liberal protectionists were also saying those same things. Um, so it wasn't just a different strategy for how to achieve uh, equal legal rights because liberal protectionists didn't want men and women to have exactly the same legal rights. They, they were open to having men and women share certain legal rights like the right to serve on juries, hold public office, but they did not want men and women's legal rights to be categorically grouped together. They thought the best way to help and care for women was through uh, protection, empowerment through protection mm -hmm. and sex specific rights. So now I'm gonna get to the op-ed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, went off on a tangent there, but I thought it was so important to highlight. Um, so I highlight a passage in the op-ed that you had sent to me, which was so great for really highlighting the continual emphasis and the opposition position on this need to protect women and through uh, sex-specific treatment. So I'm just gonna read the quote out loud. Many supporters of the amendment want to chalk this up to a fight between those who think women are equal with men and those who don't. This is wrong. Everyone should believe that women are created equal before God. Not everyone thinks this is an excuse to ignore basic biological facts while writing our laws. So I think it's so important to recognize this fear within um, the protectionist position that equal rights would mean taking away something for, from women um, and that they're not necessarily against women having rights. And when we recognize that it pushes the pro ERA position to really emphasize how and why the law should let citizens function as individuals first and not have their rights and thus their social roles be predetermined at birth based on their reproductive anatomy. And that really pushes the pro ERA position to articulate in the best way possible that there can be an equality of rights because there can be an equality of social responsibility among all genders. And that special consideration and protection can be provided in the law based on the activity a person is engaging in and not predetermined at birth based on whatever their reproductive anatomy is. So. That's my very long answer to your question. <laughs> now, that, that is perfect because you gave us the historical context. And for, for those of you who are watching, we're going we're gonna to start taking questions from um, our attendees, but um, who may not be aware of the reference in Maine uh, is trying to have an equal rights amendment in their state constitution. They did ratify the original ERA. But now they're having um, legislators who are just basically saying, we don't need an ERA. And the arguments that uh, Rebecca was talking about are what we're hearing today in 2022. So mm -hmm. Audrey, um, I know we've got some questions for Rebecca. So if you would like to um, read one. Sure. Um, I'd like to start with um, a couple of questions about some of the women who you mentioned. So um, Virginia Adamson is asking, did Secretary of Labor Frances Perkins ever change her stance from being a protectionist? And also we had a question from Marina Grohl, did Eleanor Roosevelt yeah, eventually support the ERA? All right, that's, I did see that question from about uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. So. Perkins did not. Um, Rose, Eleanor Roosevelt, I uh, discussed this in chapter six towards, I think it was 1951, mm -hmm. 1952. What she ended up doing was putting for a very, very tentative, I don't want to say endorsement, but she said, okay, I can understand where they're coming from now and why they think um, equal rights in the law would be in the constitution would be so important for women. And this is because Eleanor Roosevelt at this time was working with the UN um, Commission on Human Rights. So she became much more sensitive to the idea of equality of rights in the law. Um, but she still, it, I mean, this is why it's problematic to say that she started to support it because at that time, she's still actively backing the Women's Status Bill, which was a competing measure against the ERU and really embodied this call for separation and rights. And she also was a part of the President's Commission on the Status of Women, which one of the main goals of the commission was to make the ERA seem to be unnecessary. Um, but I do want to say a lot of those hardcore um, liberal protectionists who were still alive in the 1970s, they eventually did start to back the ERA. And that's because of the major... Um, ideological development that took place in regards to how people were understanding the relationship between sex and gender. More and more people were uh, willing to recognize that both men and women have the capabilities to be caregivers and homemakers, and both men and women had the capabilities to be the primary wage earners and providers in a family so that you can have an equality of rights with an equality of responsibilities. 
Okay. Okay. And um, (laughs) we also have um, similar questions coming in from chat and also in the, in the Q and a Métis Sands. And I hope I'm saying your name, right. um, Why in this day and age, are we still debating the inequalities between men and women and still have so many barriers to pass the ERA as a constitutional amendment, different times, yeah, um, that's such a good question. Understandable. Yeah. So I think, you know, this is one of the reasons that it's so important to understand um, the original ERA conflict. Um, one of the main, I, I hope I don't go into another long tangent here, but one of the main arguments in my book is that the original ERA conflict created the U.S.'s gendered citizenship, which has prolonged the gaps between men and women's societal positions. Um, so one of what the what ERA opponents did in the original conflict to suppress the allure of the ERA was to put forward and create this confidence in the supposed equity, a sex specific treatment that still shapes US society to this day. So one of the questions that I had to myself a long time ago when I first became interested in the ERA in like 2008, 2009, um, the first year of my PhD program, one of the research questions I had to myself was why hadn't the recognition of persistent sex discrimination not caused more of a ubiquitous, robust, lasting push for the ERA? Why was it taking so long to be ratified when people realize that there's still societal disadvantages against women? And the answer that I came to through my research and writing of this book is that protectionists were able to suppress the ERA by putting forth this idea that it's actually better and more beneficial for women to have a separation in rights rather than to have equal rights because of this notion that equal rights would be taking away protections from women. I hope that answers the question. I can go more into detail if you want, but that's um, one of the reasons I think that there's still this fear even today within protectionism that somehow the ERA would be harmful to women. We have a question from uh, Mary Ellen Custon. She's asking, are there lessons to be learned here from the failure of separate but equal Jim Crow era laws? Mm. Yeah, that's a great one. And, you know, I am always constantly thinking about the parallels um, with separate but equal with Jim Crow laws. Um, but one thing I want to say with um, when it comes to sex is it, it, they weren't just saying separate but equal. They were saying separate and different. So um, they wanted to have an equality. This is protectionist. They wanted to have an equality of status and that women would be recognized as rights bearing citizens, just as men are rights bearing citizens but they wanted the types of rights that women would have to be specific and exclusive to women. So they want an equality of status with a differentiation of rights. But as we all know, separate is inherently unequal, so. I was gonna ask a follow-up before you go to the next question on that. Um, When we talked about some of the uh, early hearings in the 30s, I'm actually, as I, ha- I have a well, you can, I don't have any of you can see my book. <laughs> it's, got, it's so highlighted. Um, when the Congress was holding a lot of hearings back bet- between 23 and 32, um, the protectionists dominated those hearings at that time. And they advanced this three pronged argument, which I think we, we've heard before. We're going to hear them again. The amendment was too vague. What, what the heck does it mean? It threatens states' rights. And it violated America's legal tradition, of course, which was coverture. Um, all of these arguments were really raising, when they raised that specter of states' rights, protectionists were also attempting to suggest that the ERA would recklessly pave the way toward complete racial equality. And that takes us back to when the 19th Amendment was fought for. There was the fear, well, if women get the right to vote, oh my goodness, then it will be black women will get the right to vote. What, what does the, how does that kind of uh, pertain to today and particularly the efforts in the South uh, during the, the second wave fight yeah. for the ERA? Okay, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. But that's a good, that's such a good question. I'm going to have to think about it for a while, but I do want to zero in on one part. Um, So in the 1920s congressional hearings, uh, they definitely played up on the race aspect. Um, Mm -hmm. Florence Kelly, a prominent social reformer um, at the National Consumers League, in one of her testimonies in the 20s hearings, she said something along the lines of, um, if we, if the ERA were to pass, that would mean um, white women would have the same rights as a black man. So really trying to inflame these prejudiced fears and racism in order to build opposition to the ERA. Mm-hmm. But something that's so important to understand though about the ERA conflict is that, um, and I think I 
maybe suggested this in the presentation, the original ERA conflict is so such a mysterious part of U.S. history in general because the dividing lines that you see play out in other topics of U.S. history just mm -hmm. don't hold up the same way in the original conflict. So you have racist arguments on the protectionist side and also on the emancipationist side. And you have uh, support for the civil rights movement and civil rights legislation on the protection side mm -hmm. and also on the emancipationist side. So all these lines that we see being dividing factors in other areas of US history are completely blurred in the original conflict. Mm -hmm. So just as you had Florence Kelly trying to play into the racism of the country, you also have individuals on the protectionist side like Esther Peterson and Emanuel Seller who were big proponents of civil rights legislation for black Americans. And in their minds, uh, race discrimination uh, constituted an unnatural transgression against a person, but they believed that sex discrimination was actually fair and equitable and a good thing to do because in their minds, men and women were just so different that it made complete sense to treat somebody differently based on their sex. Um, and then on the emancipation side, you have individuals um, like Mary Church Terrell, a prominent black a uh, women's rights activist who was a big ERA supporter. And she saw as one component of a greater struggle for the equality, equality of all humans. Um, but then also on the emancipation side, you have individuals like Representative Howard Smith who supported the ERA, had some good connections with the NWP, believe it or not. Um, but he was a segregationist, a white supremacist, he did not like the civil rights movement. And in his mind, the ERA would mean equality for white women and white men. He did not want it to go beyond that. Um, and so in some ways, I think, you know, the history of the ERA falls into this larger story about the struggle for equity and social justice. But then in other ways, it was also used as a tool to prevent equality among certain groups of people. So it's just one of these really interesting things to try to unravel. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Audrey, I know we have some more questions and we're trying to get to as many as we can. So this next one comes from Anna Lynch. She wonders how much the abortion debate is an animating force in the protectionist argument. That's good. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Let me just cough for a second here. I think <clears throat> still getting over this cold virus. Um, okay, so one of my main objectives for this book, because the dividing factor was so unclear in the original conflict, it didn't fall along these lines that we see in other struggles in US history, that my main objective for this book was to try to figure out what was the primary dividing factor that was pushing people to be for or against the amendment. So I was really interested in trying to unravel the direct explicit arguments on both sides. And abortion doesn't come up um, explicitly like we see it in the 70s. Um, it's not to say it's not there in, implicitly, but it's not an explicit direct argument that's being made, at, again, as you see in the 70s. But I am actually in the process of starting a mini project um, that's looking at the criminalization of abortion in the mid 19th century and the movement towards trying to give women, a, uh, married women a separate legal existence. Um, so, you know, stay tuned, maybe I'll have a better answer for you then. But what is important to say though about the original year conflict, what it shows us with regard to women's struggle for reproductive freedom is the original year conflict really highlights for us that there's been for so long, these ideas deeply embedded in the US legal tradition that have denied women complete self ownership over their bodies and to have autonomy in their lives and their life and their choices for how to participate in life. Because of this idea in coverture in the common law tradition that husbands had a right to their wives' bodies for the child childbearing services. Um, and so that uh, the notion of the self governing individual that's uh, wrapped up into the traditional masculine conception of full rights bearing citizenship, implicitly denied women that status because in early US society, it was seen that women were incapable of controlling their own bodies, that their reproductive anatomy made them weak and it was too erratic and it made them dependent creatures. So when today, when we're trying to figure out why it's still so hard to get a lasting permanent recognition of women's ability to have control over their bodies and their lives, we have to recognize that there's this deep legal bedrock that has denied women that. And this is another reason why the ERA should be passed or fully uh, ratified or confirmed or however you want to say it, because we need to have this robust break from that legal foundation. Thank you. I think we have time. I'm looking at, it's at 1257. We have time for maybe one more question, Audrey. Okay. 
Okay, um, so we have a, a question in the Q&A that's sort of um, echoed in the chat as well. So um, the question is, are the growing numbers of transgendered women having an effect of the notion of gender equality and the ERA? And oops, my chat just, just moved around a bit. So the other one was asking um, about, uh, does the ERA protect all people, including LGBTQ plus, or is it primarily male, female binary? Okay, it's a great, great, great question. Um, for the last part of it, because of the wording of the ERA, I think it would be interpreted to protect everyone to have a quality of rights, no matter what your sex is or is not. Um, so just real quick, um, I understand the history of the ERA is one long story, uh, one long history that can be divided into sections. So the original conflict from the 20s up into the early 1960s, the second conflict from the 70s up into the early 1980s, and arguably we're in a third ERA conflict right now with the recent state ratifications. The main difference between the first and second conflicts is this concept, how people understood gender and sex. And I don't want to get too much into all the details there because we're short on time, but there was a profound, and I kind of touched on the presentation, but there was a profound development by the late 1960s and how people understood uh, the relationship between sex and gender and gave it gave greater recognition to the potential fluidity of it all. Um, today, we are in even more of an intellectual development with regards to the recognition of how diverse the spectrums are when it comes to sex and gender and the appreciation of the fact that there are transgender men and women and non-binary individuals. Um, so because I'm a historian, I do much better offering up concrete conclusions around developments once the dust is settled and not when it's currently unfolding. Um, so I am actively watching everything right now as it's unfolding and I'm not completely sure exactly how it's all lining up. Um, I have some loose ideas, but nothing concrete. What I, I, I the more expansive understanding of gender is absolutely um, influencing the divides of the struggle. Once again, I'm just not exactly sure how. how. I will say that I have seen, um, trying to say this the best way possible, I have seen language appearing in certain circles that's makes me think of the language that I saw coming from liberal protectionists in the original conflict. This idea that women born with a certain female anatomy, uh, because of that uh, reproductive anatomy, they need to have certain rights that need to be exclusive to them. And to expand those rights to others would be harmful to those women born with that reproductive anatomy. And so that emphasis on empowerment of uh, certain women with uh, uh, special protection. Again, though, I'm not, so there's a chance that there might be more liberal protectionism coming back around again, but I'm not exactly sure. It's just a loose observation I'm having right now, so. Thank you. Oh my, I, I, we have so many more questions. We could probably go on for another hour, um, but <laughs> Rebecca has other things that she has to do. <laughs> Um, and, and I, I just, on behalf of the ERA, NC Alliance, and all of the, uh, the partners that uh, brought this together, I want to thank you so much, Rebecca. I think all of us have learned something, and it does help us understand better. It doesn't help us be any less frustrated, but it does help us understand a little bit better why we are still in this battle, and as we like to call this third wave uh, on there. And Audrey, I think we have a winner um, so what we've done is we've looked at the 28th person who uh, logged in for the webinar for the 28th Amendment, and they are going to win an autographed copy of uh, Rebecca DeWolf's book, Gendered Citizenship. You're going to have to mark it up on your own. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Audrey, would you like to uh, announce the winner? Yes, I'm pleased to announce that is Robbie Madden. Woohoo! <laughs> Congrats. Excellent, excellent. And um, we will get Robbie Madden's information and we'll send that over to Rebecca. Uh, you know, one last comment. And what struck me when I read the book, particularly about the, the fight for the ERA during World War II, and this notion that we're out there fighting Nazism and we're out there trying to promote the benefits of democracy where every person is equal in our society. Do you think that argument, the democratic promise of the ERA still has meaning today? Oh, I hope so. I want it to. I do. I really do. I think there's definitely something to be said about that, but 
uh, there's so many things going on in the world that make me um, worried, you know, mm -hmm. so, but I, I do hope, I do hope that that is something that ERA supporters can really highlight and um, get more and more people to mm -hmm. realize that equality before the law is so uh, inherent to our democracy. So, yeah. Well, thank you again. I encourage everyone this this is a book that, um, and I would say I am pretty well versed on feminist theory and what's happened with suffrage in the ERA, but this book explored an area that I was not aware of. And I think a lot of women of our generation were not. We kind of think we were the ones that really started fighting for the ERA and our grandmothers and great grandmothers were out there slogging away. So again, thank you so much, Rebecca. Hopefully you will start feeling better. Thank you everyone who came and attended and stayed for the full hour. We appreciate all of you. Thank all you. right. And we will end the meeting. All right. Thank you. Bye. -bye.